To a lot of folks, petroleum jelly is Vaseline, bandages are Band-Aids, and MMA is the UFC. Ever since Pride shut its doors soon after the Zufa purchase, the UFC's undoubtedly been at the top of the food chain in mixed martial arts. Despite the existence of A-list fighters outside of the promotion, UFC champions are typically thought of as the absolute best of the best of the best, sir, with honors. And a lot of fans are largely disconnected with the sport outside of the octagon, full-fledged members of the cult of Dana. So when you ask the average aspiring mixed martial artist what their ultimate goal is, pun intended, intended, you know the answer. But what happens when that long-awaited call from the overseers of the octagon goes unanswered? Whether it be money, experience, life circumstances, timing, or little interest, not everyone jumps at the opportunity to hear Bruce Buffer say their name. And what better timing to explore these fighters than right after the heavyweight champion of the world decided to take a hike rather than re-sign with Dana and friends. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and here are 10 stars that turned down the UFC. Number 10, Bobby Lashley. With Brock Lesnar making a huge splash upon entering MMA, it was only natural that other pro wrestlers test themselves in unscripted combat. With a comparable pedigree in collegiate wrestling, Bobby Lashley was uniquely qualified to follow in his footsteps. In fact, his 15-2 record, at least on paper, looks better than Lesnar's 5-3-1, with admittedly lower opposition. But he took the sport seriously and had success in Strike Force, Bellator, Titan, and Shark fights, despite splitting his time with the pro wrestling world. Upon announcing his retirement from MMA last year, Lashley revealed that he was offered a contract by the UFC. While training at American Top Team, Lashley recalls discussing the offer with Dan Lambert and decided it wasn't right for him. Dana, Dana seems fair with it. He, he said, he said, you know, we can't offer him like a huge contract, but we will give him something that he can get his foot in the door and kind of and prove himself. Being prohibited from pro wrestling was the biggest drawback, especially considering he would have taken a substantial pay cut if he signed on the dotted line. Instead, Lashley headed to Bellator, where he racked up five wins and had Scott Coker's blessing to continue hitting people with steel chairs and all that good wrestling stuff. Number 9. Paddy Pimblett While his most recent win, a controversial decision over Jared Gordon at UFC 282, may have darkened his shine somewhat, Paddy Pimblett is on the short list of emerging stars in the sport. Regarded by some as Liverpool's answer to Conor McGregor, the UFC has had their eye on Paddy for far longer than his 2021 promotional debut may indicate. After winning the Cage Warriors featherweight strap in 2016, an offer was extended to fight in the UFC. Pimblett felt he needed more high-level experience and rejected the contract. When the Octagon set up shop in Liverpool with fellow hometown fighter Darren Till in the main event, another contract was offered but turned down. When speaking with MMA Junkie, Pimblett revealed the surprising reason why he passed up the offer that time. The pay was better in the regional promotion. Cage Warriors outbid the UFC and was able to retain its standout fighter. According to Patty, he was making three times what his teammate Meatball Molly made for her UFC debut on that very same card. Even after finally inking his deal several years later, the pay difference still favors his old home. However, the pay cut was offset by bigger sponsorship opportunities and, of course, those payments for all those interviews. Number 8. Gina Carano In her brief time as an active fighter, Gina Carano was able to draw attention and validity to the underdeveloped women's MMA scene, culminating in the Strike Force main event against Chris Cyborg that paid the way for women headlining major events today. So after the pop culture hype train of Ronda Rousey was cruising at full speed, it's no surprise that the UFC reached out to the original star female fighter. In 2014, reports began to surface that a rumored fight was being put together between the two. Although Carano hadn't competed since the aforementioned brutal loss to Cyborg, pairing Rousey with the budding action movie star would have been a promotional slam dunk despite the lack of competitive merit. She wants a fight. I'll be happy to oblige her if that's what she wants. As far as the paperwork was concerned, there wouldn't be the same uphill battle as other sought-after talents. Carano was technically in the UFC already since her Strike Force contract, which had four fights left on it, was absorbed by Zufa in the merger. Ultimately, Gina decided to remain on the sidelines and focus on her acting career. She would eventually fumble a hefty bag from Disney and star in a movie with Cowboy Cerrone that grossed $806 in its opening week. Although both Rousey and Carano had publicly stated that they would be willing to end their dual exiles from MMA to face one another, maybe it would be best to do it at WrestleMania or in Jake Paul's PFL. Number 7. Mamed Khalidov Prior to an unfortunate run between 2018 and 2021 in which he lost three of four fights, Mamed Khalidov was considered by many to be the best fighter outside of the UFC. With stints as KSW's champion at both middleweight and light heavyweight with a long highlight reel of finishes, the Chechnya native is a star in Poland and has sat in the spotlight for quite some time there. So, of course, as the UFC has expanded its global reach over the years, Khalidov's phone was ringing. After KOing Rodney Wallace at KSW 19, Mamed officially expressed 
expressed his desire to join the UFC roster. Done deal, right? Well, the reported $20,000 show and win bonus offered was $10,000 less than he was already getting paid without factoring in sponsorships. When speaking to some guy we've never met named P.T. Carroll in 2018, the cannibal mentioned a more generous offer being extended, but while financial terms were much better than before, the idea of leaving behind the organization he helped build in a country he called home for so long was no longer appealing. Throughout 10 years, I've been working on my name. I simply couldn't just let it go like that because it wasn't uh, as profitable for me as it is in here. The idea of leaving behind sold-out stadiums and competing against other champions across different weight classes to become a rank-and-file guy thrown into the shuffle just didn't make sense. It's highly unlikely Mohamed ever enters the octagon, but with his recent destruction of Puchanowski and his heavyweight debut at KSW 77, his phone is probably ringing off the hook if phones still had hooks, but they don't. Number 6. Yuri Prohaska The UFC light heavyweight roster was in desperate need of new exciting faces when Yuri Prohaska came aboard in 2020. Having just defended the title in Ryzen with finishes over UFC vets C.B. Dalloway and Fabio Maldonado, former Strikeforce champion King Mo, and current Bellator belt holder Vadim Nemkov on his resume, there were high hopes that he could bring that same level of excitement and success to the octagon. He certainly fulfilled those expectations, and with proper recovery from his recent shoulder injury, could once again capture gold and post-fight accolades. His journey to the belt could have come a couple years earlier, though. Apparently, the promotion reached out to Prohaska around 2018, which would coincide with the approximate time he began buzzsawing through Ryzen's light heavyweight division. Despite later admitting that joining the UFC was his dream, he declined the initial offer, feeling as though he wasn't ready to step onto the sport's biggest stage. He had more yelling and mountains to do. In between that time and his octagon debut at UFC 251, the Czech Samurai won and defended the first Ryzen light heavyweight championship and certainly upped his value with hardcore fans, eager to see what the knockout artist had to offer outside of Japan. But it sure would have been nice to see the unorthodox striker emerge as a potential opponent for then-champion John Jones. Number 5. Bibiano Fernandez. When Dream shut its doors in 2012, a wealth of talent Japanese fans enjoyed suddenly hit the free market. One of those names was Bibiano Fernandez, the former featherweight champion who had just won the bantamweight Grand Prix and divisional crown. His reported signing by the UFC was met with elation and thoughts of him standing across from the who's who of both divisions. His fighter profile was added to the UFC's website, and his first appearance would be against tough alum Roland Delorme at UFC 149. Unfortunately, a reported injury scrapped the booking. However, there was one one small issue with that whole story, he never signed a bout agreement to face Delorme or even a contract to compete in the UFC at all. Fernandez went on record that while he did negotiate with UFC officials, the contract wasn't beneficial enough for him to sign and that, unlike most others in the sport, fighting in the UFC wasn't his dream. Instead, he elected to join 1FC, where he became a dominant bantamweight champion. Fortunately, the UFC learned from this and no longer announced fights that aren't officially booked. Number 4. Shinya Aoki Japanese submission specialist Shinya Aoki has been a part of many memorable moments in the sport. However, despite his 20 years of high-level professional MMA experience, none of those occurred in the octagon. With appearances in Pride, Shudo, Dream, Strike Force, Bellator, Ryzen, and One Championship, it seems as though Aoki has been everywhere but the UFC. It certainly wasn't from lack of trying, though. A 2010 report from Middle Easy dropped a few details about an offer Aoki was given to make his UFC debut against none other than the lightweight champion BJ Penn, a fantasy matchup that you probably didn't know you wanted until right now. Shinya decided to remain in Japan for the most part, where he would continue to collect limbs and title belts. After making his way to 1FC, the UFC reached out with another opportunity to make a long-anticipated entrance to the number one brand in the sport. However, the offer was rejected yet again, with 1FC and Evolve MMA founder Chatra Citradong announcing that his lightweight champion would remain with him due to more favorable economics. Soon after, Aoki reiterated his commitment to 1, citing his comfort level fighting in Asia and a lack of desire to reach North American fans. Perhaps his only two stateside appearances, both lopsided losses in cages to Eddie Alvarez and Gilbert Melendez, informed his decision. Number 3. Ben Askren If you said the name Ben Askren to a newer fight fan, they'd know him as being on the business end of the fastest KO in UFC history, or the first MMA fighter to add to the boxing resume of Jake Paul. But some of us have been around long enough to remember when he was considered by some, especially in the extended absence of GSP, the best welterweight in the world. After the two-time Division I wrestling champion made his way over to MMA, he dominated 
dominated Bellator's welterweight division, winning and defending the belt with relative ease. But when his contract was completed, Askren found himself in the middle of an ongoing feud between Dana White and then Bellator head Bjorn Rebney. Rebney's public offer to waive matching rights if the UFC granted Askren an immediate title shot was quickly torpedoed by White, who responded with an apparent lowball offer and public statements that the freshly vacated Bellator champion needed more experience. By the way, this was around the same time the UFC signed his Rufus Sport training partner, CM Punk. Askren took to the media to express similar kind thoughts about White and talks ceased. Askren then signed to 1FC and continued his dominant ways, accepting a $50,000 show win contract in his first fight before the eventual trade for Demetrius Johnson. Number 2. Israel Adesanya If you watched Israel Adesanya seem to effortlessly handle good grapplers like Derek Brunson and Marvin Vittori, you might be surprised to watch his amateur MMA outing in late 2009. The man who shrugged off takedowns with enough consistency to showcase his world-class kickboxing abilities found himself neutralized and controlled through most of the contest. The last stylebender would later joke that his performance in that fight was so poor that Eugene Behrman was hesitant to let him begin training at what would become his longtime gym, City Kickboxing. Perhaps that's why he doesn't consider his delayed entrance into the UFC as a bad thing. Originally offered a contract years before making his debut at UFC 221, it's possible that we could have gotten something much closer to the hesitant and nullified novice than the calculated and fluid striker that would win the middleweight title. However, contractual obligations elsewhere prevented him from accepting the offer. In 2015, a trip to the Black Zillions to prepare Rumble Johnson for his ill-fated title shot against John Jones showed him that he could compete at the highest level of MMA. But with his efforts divided over three different combat sports, it's unlikely that Izzy was spending as much time patching the holes in his overall game. In the span of a few months, he won a heavyweight kickboxing tournament, a cruiserweight boxing tournament, and three MMA fights. The following year, he would abandon the sweet science and double down on kickboxing and MMA careers before finally narrowing it down to one sport, winning the middleweight titles in AFC and Hex Fight Series. Number 1. Fedor Emelianenko If the UFC were a jaded, lovesick, middle-aged man drunkenly spilling his emotions out, Fedor Emelianenko would be the long-lost love that got away. At a time when the overall UFC heavyweight division lacked depth, Fedor ruled over their much more storied counterparts in pride. When Zufa purchased the Japanese promotion and absorbed most of its roster, it seemed a foregone conclusion that Fedor would be a part of the package deal and get a chance to unify the belts. Instead, he opted to sign with M1 Global, a company founded by his manager Vadim Finkelstein, and mandate a co-promotion, prompting Dana to plainly state Fedor sucks and other sweet nothings on a media call. After Affliction went belly up, the UFC reportedly offered Fedor a title shot against Brock Lesnar and a multi-million dollar purse for his troubles, but refusing to allow Fedor to compete in combat Sambo or build the dummy in M1 Arena stopped talks. In 2015, he left another offer on the table and decided to do back-to-back -back one offs with Ryzen and EFN, which ironically was broadcast on UFC Fight Pass, What the Hell is Going On in the Octagon. After buying two promotions he competed in and going out of its way to acquire the legend, The Last Emperor never took the bait for one reason or another. Dana, as a friend, I have to tell it to you straight, he's just not that into you. Some really big shout-outs are in order here to Ant Walker for writing this wonderful piece, and of course Ben Rosette for the intro tunes. Go show all those men sincere love on their socials. Liking and subscribing would also be a great thing, and I think we would both benefit. Were you surprised by any of the stars on this list? Let us know down in the comments. And thanks for watching, guys. I'm Audi5000.